The search for life within our solar system continues unabated. Scientists are following the signs for water, either deep oceans or hot springs where life can evolve. There are exciting candidates to explore. The icy moons of Jupiter, oceans in the sky. Orbiting the giant Jupiter are three prime candidates. Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system. Callisto, once thought to be dead, may harbor a salty ocean. And the active Europa, with its plumes of water erupting into space. The European Space Agency is about to launch a probe to investigate these three potential sites, a daring mission called JUICE. JUICE is a Jupiter icy moon explorer. So it's the first large mission of the Cosmic Vision program of the European Space Agency and has the uh, objective to study the Jupiter system and three of the Galilean moons, three icy moons, which are Europa, Galileo, uh, Ganymede and Callisto. This mission is uh, of particular importance for the European industry because this is the first time that Europe is going to Jupiter. Uh, so we are uh, supporting the European Space Agency and beyond the European scientific community in their endeavor to go to Jupiter and explore Jupiter and their, uh, and their moons. The scientific objectives of Jews are uh, multiple. So first of all, <clears throat> we have the humanity always pose itself a question, are we alone in the universe? Is there life outside uh, Earth? To respond to this question, first, we need to answer to another question. Are environments where life can be sustained before going and search for life. And this is one of the main objectives for Jews, to search if on the environment, on the ocean world of Europa and Ganymede, there are the conditions to sustain life. Now, from the past missions, we know that some of these conditions are fulfilled, and we, are going to, and we want to go with Jews to investigate even deeper and to make sure that these conditions are, uh, are there. And this condition as for example, uh, there is water, there is liquid, liquid water, uh, there is a source of energy inside the planets, so there is energy. There are the um, chemical <clears throat> compounds which are needed to sustain life, the life as we know, so based on uh, carbon. Um, and is a protected, is a stable environment because it's under the crust. Of the, of the moons. So once these four elements are fulfilled, there is the probability that life will be sustained outside Earth is very high. The other objective of Jews is to study the Jupiter system in its integrality as seen as a miniaturized solar system, if you want. We have a, a gas giant with a bodies that go around, the, around this body and uh, studying the, inter the interaction of the, um, of the gas giant with the, these bodies, we can understand better, for example, the development of our solar system, uh, how it was born, how it works, and etc. There is a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Vili today.
So JUICE is a very uh, exciting mission. So we are going to explore Jupiter in details. And in particular, we would like to know whether there are uh, conditions uh, hospitable for life around a gashed uh, giant like uh, Jupiter. And we are going to focus that on the three icy moons, which are Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And we would like to know uh, whether inside those moons there are conditions which are interesting for life. And we are going in particular to, uh, to explore the, the liquid water which are underneath the crust of those moons. In the past, uh, there were other missions that um, passed, they analyzed the Jupiter system, uh, like jo uh, Galileo, for example, has given us important information to uh, build the JUICE mission. There is also Cassini that passed by, that we gather a lot of data also from, uh, from it and also from observation from Earth, also observation from Hubble, for example, has provided us lots of data which are precious to, to build JUICE and to build also the profile of the mission to know what we are going to, to study. We have in total 10 scientific instruments on JUICE uh, and basically we will, we will observe Jupiter and, and its moons in all possible wavelengths and, and type of observations that we can do. So we have a number of telescopes in all wavelengths uh, visible infrared, ultraviolet. Uh, we have a radiometer to sense the atmosphere, the structure of uh, winds uh, of Jupiter and their moons. Uh, and we have uh, electric and magnetic sensors. Some of them will be deployed uh, at the tip of a magnetometer boom. So RIME is this big antenna that you see there, deployed just behind us. Uh, it is a radar antenna that is working at a very low wavelength, 9 megahertz. So for that to happen, you need a very long piece of antenna uh, that will be able to sound very deep below the surface, the, the internal structure of the moons, in particular Europa, Callisto and Ganymede. The objective is to try and locate the liquid uh, water ocean that is underneath the icy crust of these moons. As of today, we are still not sure how deep we have to, we have to dig, let's say, to find this ocean. And this antenna will help us figure out at which depth we can find this ocean. At the moment, the uh, nominal science is for a scene to last four years. In these four years, Jupiter will make uh, all the investigation. It will uh, make some flybys of Europa, flybys of Callisto, and then we'll go into the details of the analysis of Ganymede. We stay around the, in orbit around Ganymede for uh, a good part of the uh, Jupiter tour. JUICE will start its science mission about six months prior to entering orbit around Jupiter, making observations as it approaches its destination. Once in the Jovian system, a gravity assist flyby of Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, also the largest moon in the solar system, will help JUICE enter orbit around the gas giant. During its operations, the probe will make two flybys of Europa in July 2032. Europa has the strongest evidence of an ocean of liquid water under its icy shell. JUICE will study the Moon's active zones, surface composition, geology and the plasma environment around the Moon. A sequence of Callisto flybys will then be used to study this ancient cratered world that may also harbor a subsurface ocean, but will also change the angle of JUICE's orbit, making it possible to investigate the polar regions of Jupiter. Now that the probe is fully assembled, it has to be thoroughly flight tested to ensure its survivability, because the giant's magnetosphere traps an intense and dangerous radiation environment. This milestone is very important because here we have the spacecraft, it's integrated, it's ready. We have all the 10 instruments are delivered, are there. All the platform units are there, the antennas, is all in place. So the spacecraft is ready for the test campaign to verify finally that everything's work as expected within the performances they are expecting. And this is one year from launch. So this is a very important milestone. The spacecraft integrated is there and we can carry on with the test phase. 
So we start first with uh, electromagnetic compatibility test. Uh, the goal is to verify that the spacecraft has a sufficiently low level of electromagnetic perturbations because a number of instruments of JUICE will sense electric and magnetic fields at Jupiter and we do not want the spacecraft to be a source of perturbation for that. After that we will do a number of mechanical tests. It will be done over summer. Here the goal is to verify that the spacecraft can survive uh, the launch environment that will be imposed by IN5 when we will launch to Jupiter. It is true that the JUICE spacecraft that we can see on the background is going to be launched in space, meaning that it's not like for aircraft. We can repair something after a couple of hours of working. We need to make sure that before we launch, everything will work properly as expected. And then there will be additional tests, like a vibration test, uh, including the, the, with the solar array, so that will be quite exciting. We have also what we call EMC test, so to make sure that the spacecraft is quiet from the electromagnetic point of view, it's very important for the science of the mission. And additional tests, like a communication between uh, the spacecraft and the ESOC flight control team, that we need to control the spacecraft once it flights. So all these tests will take place in the coming uh, 10 months. And after that, uh, hopefully the spacecraft will be declared uh, ready for launch and will ship the spacecraft to uh, its uh, final destination on, on Earth, which is the French Guiana spaceport. Replicating the environs of space is no easy task here on Earth. At ESA's test center, ESTEC, in the Netherlands, is the large space simulator, which can model the vacuum of space and simulate both the extreme heat and cold of deep space. It is Europe's largest vacuum chamber, and its internal black panels, which are filled with liquid nitrogen, were used to cool the environment down to around minus 180 degrees Celsius. To test against extreme heat, lamps are used to raise the temperature up to 250 degrees Celsius. Juice, in order to fly to Jupiter, will do some gravity uh, assist around uh, several planets, among them the Earth and Venus, where, which is very uh, close to the Sun. And in fact, all the um, electronics inside uh, the spacecraft uh, are supposed to, to work properly uh, in a certain range of temperature and the thermal design of the JUICE spacecraft aims at protecting this unit from the very harsh environment, cold or hot, uh, for this unit in order for them to work properly when we will uh, start to do science at uh, the Jupiter Asimons. To reproduce the, the heat side of space, eh, so when we go close to the sun, we simulate the sun. And in order to do so, we have a, a set of lamps, very powerful lamps that are reflected in a 20, 121 mirrors that can be uh, reconfigured depending on the mission characteristics. And in the, this case, we simulate the heat of the sun while the spe spacecraft goes through Venus. Uh, why Venus? Because the, the JUICE mission is doing a flyby in Venus before going uh, finally to, to Jupiter. Yeah, so when I saw JUICE going to the space simulator, I had a mixed feeling, of course, because it was a very uh, scary moment. You're, it's a little bit like your baby spacecraft, so you're a bit scared that uh, something will go wrong. But at the same time, you know that the, the team in particular, the test center people, they know what they are doing. So it's a quite a secure uh, activity. So it was a mixed feeling, but you always feel nervous when you see the spacecraft uh, going to the large space simulator. And in addition to that, we have also some requirements coming from the environment itself of Jupiter, like temperature and radiation. Jupiter is a very aggressive radiation environment that is, doing, that is making the whole uh, design of a spacecraft even more complex. Jupiter has the largest magnetosphere in the solar system, 18,000 times more powerful than Earth's. In combination with the sulfur dioxide ejected by the Moon, the space around Jupiter is loaded with plasma. The magnetosphere also traps and accelerates particles, forming an intense radiation field that is thousands of times more powerful than Earth's Van Allen belt. 
The result is a very hazardous environment for spacecraft and potentially humans. After that, we will also uh, test the propulsion system in order to be sure that it is uh, leak tight and fully operational when placed into a flight configuration. We will do a second thermal vacuum test uh, in a chamber very close to this facility in October in order to verify in pressure and temperature conditions and full flight configuration that the spacecraft uh, is behaving nominally in all functions. And finally, after having tested the spacecraft in all these variants and environments, we will verify a last time that uh, from a functional perspective, the spacecraft behaves nominally and is ready for shipment to the launch site. That launch site is Europe's spaceport in Kourou in French Guiana, where the venerable Ariane 5 will lift juice into space. It will also be the final launch of the Ariane 5 rocket series, one of the most reliable launch systems with 112 launches and just five partial or complete failures. The Ariane 5 heavy lift vehicle has launched many of the most important space probes, including the Rosetta mission and most recently the Webb Space Telescope. It will be replaced by the Ariane 6 heavy lift booster. JUICE will be launched uh, next year, in 2023, uh, in April, the beginning of April. The launch window will open on the 5th of April and will stay open for about three weeks because of uh, celestial uh, uh, mechanics. And then the spacecraft, will, before being injected into the, tra uh, the transfer orbit to Jupiter, will have to uh, acquire more speed and we will need to do a certain amount of gravity assist, assist to the inner uh, planets of the solar system. We will do a gravity assist, which will be a first, which will be a uh, Moon-Earth gravity assist, then there will be a Venus gravity assist, other two flybys of, of Earth, and then will be projected to the insertion orbit to Jupiter for other two years. So overall, it will take about eight years to get to Jupiter. The gravity assists. 25 in total will allow the probe to gain the necessary speed to reach its final destinations without consuming the 3,000 kilograms of precious fuel reserved for course corrections and orbital insertions. JUICE will arrive at Jupiter in 2031, followed by a proposed orbital insertion around Ganymede in 2034 all part of the European Cosmic Vision Program. The Cosmic Vision Program has an uh, objective of studying also outer worlds. So it will be complementary to future missions, to, to mission in uh, currently in development, like uh, Plato, like uh, Ariel, like SMILE, and, uh, and be complementary with the future missions. It will be a vision for the study <coughs> Of, of Venus, with Athena, for example, for the study of the uh, of the universe, <clears throat> with uh, Lisa for the study of the uh, gravitational waves. So it will be complementary to have a full and round information uh, on the uh, on as astronomy and planetary uh, planetary science, and it will be also part of uh, the inspiration that the Cosmic Vision Program wants to transmit to to the scientific community and to the public. So JUICE has been developed by a um, huge co industrial consortium to build the spacecraft itself. So in particular, uh, we have Airbus France, which is the main contractor to build the spacecraft, and uh, which is made 95% uh, 90, by European companies. It's about over 100 companies uh, from Europe and about the 5% of contribution from the uh, United States. Uh, the uh, JUICE embarks 10 uh, scientific payloads and the payloads um, are con the contribution from uh, uh, leading funding agency, which are the space agencies. So in particular, we have CNES, uh, there is uh, the Italian Space Agency, DLR, German Space Agency, uh, there is the UK Space Agency, uh, Swedish Space Agency, and we have also, also contribution on an instrument and other contribution from NASA. 
as well as from JAXA uh, and also from the Israeli Space Agency. And each of these uh, scientific consortium is built by other institutions from uh, as well over, over Europe. So we have also contribution from Austria, from Belgium, from uh, is a European uh, wide uh, consortium. Over time, Juicy's orbit around Ganymede will naturally decay. Eventually, there will not be enough propellant to maintain it, and it will make a grazing impact onto the surface in late 2035. Juice will not be alone in its mission. NASA is also launching a probe to the same local. However, its primary goal will be to study Europa exclusively. The mission is the Europa Clipper. Due for launch two years after JUICE, the Europa Clipper will ride a SpaceX Falcon Heavy. This time, the probe will utilize Mars for a gravity assist in 2025, then Earth a year later, arriving in the Jovian system in 2030, a year ahead of JUICE. Due to the harsh radiation environment, the Clipper will not orbit Europa, but instead orbit Jupiter and make multiple passes of Europa, 44 encounters over three and a half years. Utilizing the other Jovian moons for gravity assists the Clipper, which will adjust its orbit to pass by Europa and various altitudes from 2,700 kilometers to a mere 25 kilometers, where it will be able to pass through the water plumes erupting from the surface. It will carry nine instruments, including thermal and radar imaging, ultraviolet spectroscopy, and surface dust analyzer. This allows us to have a mission that's many years long and to collect and transmit lots and lots of data. As Europa orbits Jupiter, it flexes, and we could measure the gravitational change of Europa by encountering Europa at different points in its orbit. On a typical flyby, we would turn on our remote sensing instruments, we would image the surface, we would interrogate the surface with spectroscopy, and we would do the same thing on the way out. And we would essentially rinse and repeat and do this many, many times until we understand Europa globally. Because once we have investigated whether life can be sustained in you know, the icy moons of Europa or Ganymede, then there could be other missions that will go to analyze more in depth if life is really there. Maybe with uh, penetrators, with rovers, with sample return missions. And one of the, of the objective also of uh, cosmic vision is uh, to be an inspirator for future missions. Also for a sample return, for example, why not on the icy moons of Jupiter? It is one of the most complex and sophisticated scientific instruments ever built. It is orbiting our sun a million kilometers out in space in temperatures of minus 266 degrees Celsius. It is a time machine that will peer deep into the past and reveal unexplored reaches. And it will be our key to understanding where we fit in this enormous universe.
launched aboard an Ariane 5 rocket, the James Webb telescope has successfully reached its destination, unfurled and begun its great adventure. Hubble revolutionized astronomy. Hubble showed us the early universe. Hubble showed us what the universe works like. And as these revolutionary findings came along, people realized we need a next generation space telescope. This was 25 years ago. And this is how Webb came into being. Now, you can see 25 years of development time. This is not unusual for a large space mission from the first idea to fruition, to the launch. And this is why these missions are really once in a generation launches. We are witnessing something particularly special that an astronomer typically gets to witness once, if they are lucky, twice in their entire career. James Webb Space Telescope is a collaboration between NASA, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency. So altogether, that's 24 countries, lots of industrial companies, academic institutions, universities, and thousands of scientists across the whole world are now waiting to use the telescope. So by combining the power of the best in engineering and science from all of those countries in this international collaboration, we can do much more together than we could do on our own. The origin of Webb is the search for our origins. We want to find out where the first galaxies formed, how they formed, when they started making their stars in the very early universe, not long after the Big Bang. And to do this, Webb uses his big mirror and his infrared vision to look into these really early days, observe the light from these galaxies that's been traveling to us for billions of years. And it shows us these galaxies how they were billions of years ago. Sure, so infrared is a longer wavelength than visible light. So we can't see infrared, but James Webb can. Um, and what's important about an infrared telescope is it allows us to see through clouds of gas and dust and see the planets and stars and galaxies that are beyond. Um, in addition, James Webb has a larger mirror than Hubble, um, so it can see back further in time and it's orbiting at a different point. James Webb is very complementary to everything that has been done before to Hubble, to Herschel, uh, but will be a huge step forward just because the collective area is huge. 6.5 meter meter is pretty impressive. Hubble, as a comparison, was 2.4. So we're talking of a collective area which is much much bigger, much more sensitivity, we say 100 times more sensitive, um, with a complement of state-of-the-art instruments, which will take images and spectra in uh, wavelength regimes that we haven't explored as much from space up to now. The telescope houses four scientific packages. MIRI, a mid-infrared instrument, the near-infrared near-cam, near-spec, a spectrographic analyzer, and the nearest imager and guidance sensor. The near infrared spectrograph or near spec, it's one of the four scientific instruments that we fly on James Webb Space Telescope or Webb Telescope. Uh, it's very important because it will allow us to analyze the light of the astronomical objects we will observe. A uh, spectrograph works uh, uh, very much like a prism. In fact, there's a prism inside our instrument and other uh, gratings. And they, uh, like the prism, uh, splits the white light into its uh, rainbow colors. These instruments will split the near infrared lights from uh, the astronomical object into its components. And this is very useful to scientists because from that they can understand the physics of the objects they are observing, what are the temperature, the elements, the physical condition, and therefore we can understand what's going on on the objects we observe. So we will observe all sorts of astronomical objects from galaxies and the focus is very much on very far away galaxy, galaxies that are 13 billion light years away from us. So uh, um, back in the far past that they were forming soon after the Big Bang from a very what we call nearby objects, which are not really nearby, but they are exoplanets in stars around our, uh, our neighborhood, the neighborhood of the solar systems in our galaxy. Um, so this is the 
the type of objects we will observe and uh, uh, investigations, it's about uh, understanding what are the atmospheric condition on the exoplanets or what are the physical condition of the galaxies we observe far away. So, uh, going back to the um, very uh, far away galaxies, this uh, instrument NIRSPEC will uh, play a crucial role in the, uh, observing this far away galaxy and telling us what is the physics. So, uh, again, what are elements are present, in which proportion, what are the temperature, and that is fundamental if you want to understand how galaxy form which is one of the big questions we have in astronomy. We see uh, trillions of galaxies around us, how all these galaxies form. And, and, and with this instrument, we can uh, piece together more of the puzzle. It complements the other instrument because of its function of a spectrograph. So on uh, the Webb telescope we have cameras, uh, um, other type of spectrograph, one particular MIRI, which is also a, a um, partially European instrument, which will focus on the mid-infrared light. Near-infrared is the focus of NIRSPEC. Uh, so uh, analyzing the light that comes from astronomical object in the near infrared wavelength range. Uh, while with the camera we see images, so we detect the objects and we, we know where they are and what are the main characteristics, with near spec we focus really on certain objects and analyze the lights uh, and split the lines into its components and with that understand the physics of the objects we are observing. The telescope is in a halo orbit at the L2 or second Lagrange point and is orientated away from our sun, with the sun shield keeping the instruments at their very low operating temperatures. Where is the telescope pointing relative to the spacecraft? So we waited for the near infrared camera to get uh, the detectors cold enough um, so that we could take the images and we did some evaluation of that. And once we were convinced that it could take images, we were really trying to determine if we pointed at a bright isolated star, where's the telescope pointing? So we, we picked a star that was very bright and didn't have any stars near it that would uh, contaminate the image. We know that the primary mirror segments aren't aligned yet, so, we, um, so they actually act like 18 separate telescopes, and we expect to see 18 separate images, one for each mirror, that are a little bit blurry at this point because we haven't aligned or focused anything. And so we pointed at a bright star and we made a mosaic. We actually took the near infrared camera and we took images in different parts of the sky. And then we looked for the 18 spots from the 18 different telescopes, if you will. And we were very excited to find them. They were actually very close to where we were pointing, um, well within uh, our expected size of where, where they might land. And the 18 spots were actually fairly close to each other as well. So really everything was very close to what was predicted and much better than what we considered to be the worst case um, pointing. So we were really excited about that. Over the following months, each individual mirror was adjusted and focused, then aligned together to create one single image. The alignment image of the single bright star gave an indication of the power of the Webb telescope. As seen here, behind the bright star, the image captured numerous distant galaxies. The science team then captured several sample images of different objects. The first images from the James Webb Space Telescope are designed to demonstrate the full range of the capabilities of the telescope. Scientists then sat down and studied these many test images which amazed the team. Yeah. 
it really stays the same in all three ways. We're seeing a sample of the amazing science that WEP will be able to do over the coming years. And remember, it's just a sample. Uh, so we are seeing scenes and vistas from across the universe, you know, toward the first galaxies, uh, to stellar birth and stellar death. Um, and we're seeing uh, an exoplanet spectrum for the first time with WEP showing water or steam in its atmosphere. So here, what we're seeing in, the, in this deep field image, Webb's first deep field, is a massive cluster of galaxies. And what this cluster does is it bends the light from even more distant galaxies coming behind it. And you can see that as, as a sort of bananas or streaks in the, in the field. And this field allows us to look for some of the very first luminous structures in the universe the first stars and galaxies. Uh, and this was one of the reasons that Webb was originally built. So with the Southern Ring Nebula, the image here, what you see is uh, a star that is similar to our own sun, but five billion years in the future when it dies. And so when stars like that die, they push off the, uh, the outer atmospheres. And these, this gas cloud you see is filled with elements like carbon and oxygen, kind of elements that we are made of. And this is how dying stars seed the galaxy with these elements that ultimately are important for the formation of life. So here we are seeing uh, a small group of galaxies that what we call interact, they're actually colliding with each other. And this is a very fundamental part in the evolution of galaxies. They bump into each other all the time. And when they bump into each other, they create shock waves. And in these shock waves, you have this tremendous formation of new stars. And you see these shock waves in this image here, and you see the formation of stars there. Yes, this is a set of galaxies that are uh, sort of locked in a cosmic dance. And so they're moving and they're, um, two of them are merging and we can see all of them moving around in that um, and, the, and their interactions. You also see the galaxies uh, superimposed on this field of distant galaxies in the background uh, whose light has probably traveled through the universe for billions of years. And so this is very typical for web images that everywhere we look, we're gonna have these distant galaxies in the background. And one of the main things that we want to look at with the James Webb Space Telescope is the most distant galaxies in our universe, the furthest objects away. And that also means that they were the first objects to form after the Big Bang, the first stars and galaxies about 13.5 billion years ago. The reason that all of their light is now in the infrared is because the universe is expanding. And as it expands, the light from those most distant objects gets redshifted to infrared wavelengths. So again, Hubble can't see them, but the James Webb Space Telescope is designed exactly to see these very distant, very faint objects. Oh yeah, this, this is such a beautiful image and maybe my favorite. What we see here is a stellar nursery, uh, a cloud of gas and dust that is actively forming new stars. And you see this as sort of a landscape that looks like mountains because the cloud is being eroded away by hot stars that's off the field to the top. And they're, they're, they're cooking off the cloud. And as they do that, they, they, they push on it. And so what that means is that uh, you can form new stars sort of close to the surface of the cloud there and you can see those stars popping out and you can see them also uh, create jets and outflows as part of this process um, that, that, that move through the cloud and create these streaky structures in it.
In comparison, the Hubble imagery here captures the visible light. Now, compared to the web images, you can see the dark dust turn transparent, revealing what is within and behind the veil. I'm really excited about James Webb and the spectroscopic capabilities. It's absolutely revolutionary, the sensitivity and the resolution we can get to look at the, the, the dust and the, the forming stars in some of the very most distant galaxies to us, where we can actually see individual stars and work out what the chemical compositions they're producing in terms of dust and the minerals they're producing and the life cycle of matter in the universe, that chemical evolution of galaxies. And no other instrument, no ground-based instrument can do this because of the atmosphere. Only space-based instruments can do this. And previously, the previous Previous generations have been so small they've been able to only look at galaxies in the Milky Way or very, in the Magellanic Clouds. But James Webb will be able to push that envelope out to lots of galaxies in the local group and so we can look at very difficult different formation scenarios towards the early universe. So that's what I'm most excited about is these dying stars and forming stars. The hope is Webb will be able to see so far back in time, it will reveal the very first galaxies and stars created after the Big Bang. Lots of big questions. Uh, how, how do galaxies evolve so the Hubble deep field has given us some hints of what we think is happening but we haven't been able to see it in enough detail or with enough galaxies to really know so it's going to fill in almost you could think of it as a gap in time between the Big Bang and the galaxies we can study with Hubble and we'll find galaxies that are in that gap. This image is of the spiral galaxy IC5332 which is over 29 million light years away. The infrared web sees through like an X-ray into the interior structure of the galaxy. Well, it's going to allow us to um, understand every phase of cosmic history for the last 13 and a half billion years. So we will answer questions like how are galaxies formed and where do we fit into the cosmos? We'll be able to see the formation of stars and planets. We'll also be able to understand atmospheres of exoplanets. The James Webb also captured images of local residents in our own solar system. Here is Jupiter seen in the near infrared. It reveals the polar auroras and the heat signatures deep within the clouds of our largest neighbour. Here is Neptune as never seen before, its rings clearly visible along with several of its moons. The most prominent features of Neptune's atmosphere in this image are a series of bright patches in the planet's southern hemisphere that represent high-altitude methane ice clouds. More subtly, a thin line of brightness circling the planet's equator could be a visual signature of global atmospheric circulation that powers Neptune's winds and storms. I think the great thing about Webb is that it actually touches all of astronomy. So because it's so flexible, you can use it to study things inside our own solar system, but you can also use it to find examples of the very first galaxies. So it really is spanning almost the entire history of the universe. So it's really going to be transformative to lots of different areas. I think the two areas that are going to be transformed the most are my own field, which is finding and understanding these very early galaxies, and then on the other end of the scale, actually looking at planets around other stars that are relatively nearby to us. But I think every single astronomer in the world will ultimately be taking 
taking some of the results from web and incorporating it into their own research. Astronomers have made giant steps in our understanding of the universe over the past decades, but there remains much to learn about our cosmic origins, and the range of questions waiting to be answered is causing high expectations. Web is more than tens of thousands of scientists. Web is 8 billion people looking for the origins.